is Thomas Merton? That was a question I asked myself when I saw a documentary on TV uh, after I graduated from college and been working at uh, General Electric for about six years. I was pretty miserable in my job. I, I really just uh, didn't like working in accounting and finance. It's a great uh, career for a lot of people. It just didn't fit me. And anyway, one day I came home, sort of dog-tired after work, turned on the television set, and saw a documentary on public television about this Trappist monk named Thomas Merton. And the, the, something about the documentary and something about his face on the documentary just radiated peace and really drew me in and prompted me to go out, track down, and actually read his autobiography called The Seven Story Mountain. And that led me to uh, thinking about religious life, thinking about changing my life, and finally entering the Jesuits, which I did two years later. So it's no stretch of the imagination to say that Thomas Merton changed my life. Thomas Merton was born in 1915 in France in a small town. Uh, his father, Owen, was a New Zealander and a painter. His mother, Ruth, was an American. Uh, his father died very young, or rather, his father died when uh, Thomas Merton was very young. Merton ended up going to school at a place in England called Oakham, which he hated, uh, and then ended up uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, while he was at Cambridge, uh, he ran with a fairly wild group of people. Uh, it is rumored that he got a woman pregnant. And as a result of all this, uh, his guardian, uh, his mother had died by that time as well, suggested that he go to the United States, and he readily accepted. So Merton goes to the United States. He enrolls in 1939 at Columbia University, where he falls in finally with a more congenial group of guys. But they're still pretty um, hard partiers. They're going out drinking. Uh, they. Uh, hang out with all sorts of women, uh, they basically oversleep, they don't go to classes, uh, even though Merton's very brilliant. His life is sort of starting to look very bleak to him, and he talks in his autobiography uh, about thinking about committing suicide. There's a very dramatic passage where he is across from Penn Station in New York at a hotel and looks down from the seventh floor and starts thinking about what it would mean to jump. So Merton has a very difficult upbringing very difficult and sad in many ways because of the death of his parents' uh, adolescence. And um, sometime around 1939, he's reading a book of philosophy, and it starts to get him interested in the Catholic Church. And one day, he decides that he's going to get uh, baptized. So he gets up, he goes to a local church, Corpus Christi Church, uh, up near Columbia University, presents himself at the door and says, here I am, I'd like to be baptized. And he gets baptized to the surprise of his friends, and like most of the things that Merton does, uh, he does it whole hog. Uh, he then decides two years later he's going to be a Trappist monk, uh, which is one of the most austere of all the religious orders. His friends are shocked. Uh, Merton enters uh, shortly before World War II begins uh, in December of 1941 in the monastery. And he thinks that he's going to sort of submerge himself in the anonymity of monastic life. Instead, uh, somewhat like Therese of Lisieux, uh, he is asked to write his autobiography. And he writes the autobiography called The Seven Story Mountain that becomes a huge bestseller. It sells 60,000 copies in the first year, and it heralds the renewal of monastic life. As a result of his book, uh, the Abbey of Gethsemane, where he is in Kentucky, gets dozens and dozens of applicants. And um, he becomes what he calls, quite ruefully, uh, the famous Thomas Merton. So from then on in, uh, Merton is this inveterate writer. He writes about everything and anything. He writes about Zen Buddhism, uh, liturgical renewal, uh, monasticism, and certainly, uh, most famously, the contemplative life. Uh, and he keeps up this wonderful correspondence and even becomes a kind of father to people during the Cold War. He writes a lot about uh, peace um, and nonviolence. And Merton uh, dies uh, quite young. He's on a, uh, a trip for the first time outside of his monastery to Bangkok. And um, he gives a little speech. And at the end of his speech, he says, by way of saying goodbye to the people, you know, sort of wrapping up the speech, he says, and now I will just disappear. And he goes into his room, and he takes a shower. And on his way out of the shower, he slips, grabs a fan, uh, and is electrocuted. And in a very strange irony, he is brought back on a plane that is carrying the uh, victims of the Vietnam War. Uh, some soldiers. So this pacifist goes home in that very kind of poetic way. And this person who professed a vow of stability to the monastery ends up uh, meeting his maker, really, uh, halfway around the world. So it's a very unusual and very strange and very poetic death. Mm -hmm.
the people that appreciate Merton the most are people who feel that they're imperfect, which is everybody. Thomas Merton was a very difficult person to get along with uh, in the community. He was always complaining about uh, not having enough privacy, not having enough quiet. Uh, he had a lot of uh, sort of high standards about what the monastic life should be like, and yet his brothers loved him. And most of all, he knew his faults. Uh, he would complain and complain and complain about not being able to go away and travel, his abbot, uh, and he would have these knockdown, drag out fights. And yet at the end, Merton would ask the abbot to hear his confession. But in his letters, he's extremely funny. Uh, and he has a wonderful sense of humor. And he also knows to make fun of himself, too. Uh, there's a wonderful story where he writes to his agent early on in life, uh, before he's become this great kind of publishing phenomenon. And he says, he laments the fact uh, to his agent saying, uh, you know, there are so many bad books out there being published right now. Why can't my bad book be published too? So, I mean, there's a sense that he has a very playful uh, sense of humor about life and about himself. And I think just so, he knew so many people. He was in touch with people like Boris Pasternak, uh, Daniel Berrigan, the Jesuit activist, people from all over the world. John the 23rd would write to him that this was a guy who was, first of all, brilliant, but also understood uh, you know, that life really shouldn't be taken so seriously. Um, and he knew his faults, I think, better than anybody else. He was able to laugh at himself. Well, I would say there's uh, four people responsible for my entrance into religious life, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and Thomas Merton. If it wasn't for Thomas Merton, I wouldn't be a Jesuit. Uh, I find him uh, just my model of... Um, what I, I hope to do and hope to be. He's a very holy person, he's prayerful, uh, he's serious about his religion, but he's not afraid to challenge people from time to time. He is, uh, he's a good writer. Uh, he understands that you know writing needs to be done for God. He's a spiritual master. I mean, he wrote about everything, really. And I think the strongest writings he has are his own writings, his autobiographical writings. I mean, he does write on the Cold War, he writes on prayer. Um, but it's his journals, I think, at least for me, uh, The Seven Story Mountain, which is his main autobiography, The Sign of Jonas, um, which is the sort of uh, sequel to The Seven Story Mountain, where he talks about uh, religious life and how imperfect it can be. It's his journals where people see how human he is. There's a part in uh, his secular journals, which are the journals uh, that he wrote when he was in his 30s and 40s, where he talks about going to the World's Fair and looking at all these people, looking at some works of art and thinking these people don't know what they're looking at. It was pretty arrogant. But later in life, Thomas Merton came to see that he was not separated from people. There's a very famous passage in one of his journals where he's in Louisville. He's at the corner of 4th and Walnut Streets. And he has this wonderful mystical revelation where he says, I realized finally that I was connected to all these people that I was them and they were me. And it's this beautiful image of connectedness. And he says, but how do you go around telling people that they're shining like the sun? And I think one of the things that people like about Merton is they can see through these very transparent journals how sinful, how flawed. I mean, he always talks about uh, how he has to struggle with his own pride and his frustration and his anger at his abbot. He was always butting heads with his abbot that is the head of the monastery. Thomas Merton tells us that we can be flawed, we can be ourselves and still be holy. One of my favorite quotes from Thomas Merton is, for me to be a saint means to be myself. And yet we see this person who's very flawed and who struggled and who doubts and who gets angry, but we can take the long view and say, this is still a very holy person. We see Merton with all of his contradictions, with all of his flaws, with some of his petulance, some of his anger. He broke his monastic vows uh, once in a very serious way by having an affair with a woman. But we can stand back and we can say, this is still a very holy man. And sometimes I like to think that's the way that God looks at us.